Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Disease Model Generation, Five Steps to a 3D Cancer Spheroid Model. I'm Donna Trollinger, Senior Global Market Development Manager at Thermo Fisher Scientific, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is hosted by Labrus and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more, visit our website at thermofisher.com slash 3D models. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the ask a question box and click send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the continue education window at the bottom of your screen to obtain your credits. I'd like to now welcome my Thoma Fisher colleague and today's speaker, Field Application Scientist Edwin Gullis. Edwin, you may now begin your presentation. Hello, everyone. My name is Edwin Gullis, and I'm the Field Application Scientist for 3D and Advanced Cell Models here at Thermo Fisher. I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to the webinar today. And today's webinar will highlight the five steps to generating cancer steroid models. Here's an agenda highlighting what the webinar will cover today. First, we'll start with some background discussing what 3D cell models are. Then I'll review some considerations when uh, developing cancer steroid models. The main part of this talk will examine the five steps that will require to generate cancer steroid. Finally, we'll end the presentation with a summary and a list of available online resources. Before I go into the presentation, I want to take the time to acknowledge our global R&D teams who put an extensive effort to provide the material uh, for this webinar. So why do we create 3D models? We want to, we want to create an in vitro approach to predict human biology. To recapture human biology, we want to be able to mimic the inputs that impact the body and create a representative cell system that can capture these phenomena. As with the human biology, we want aim to measure changes to these inputs in our created cellular system to give us a glimpse of what we would expect to see in an in vivo or human setting. So we want to build these cell models to predict outputs that best translate to humans. So what do we consider a 3D model? Tool it all gives a nice definition uh, uh, of what we consider uh, a 3D model is. It's a cellular cluster from a particular cell source that is capable of proliferating and self-organizing and showing some sort of similarity to the tissue that it came from. The diagram on the right here illustrates the different in vitro models going from increasing complexity as you go from left to right. Starting with the 2D monolayer culture, these are your typical immortalized cells that are grown in a plastic dish or flask. It's usually your drug's first exposure to a living system. This technique has been around for several decades and is used for doing early stage toxicity effects, efficacy, and looking at mechanisms of action. As you move to the middle of this diagram, we increase the complexity by utilizing multiple cell types in what we call the co-culture system. In the co-culture system, we want to see how the interaction of these multiple cell types can more represent the in vivo setting closer than what you'd see in the 2D setting. Organized chip modalities incorporate microfluidic systems that bring perfusion and flow capabilities to your 3D model. And complexity can also be increased when utilized cells that are procured directly from tissues as opposed to immortalized cells, which are usually used for traditional 2D models. And these uh, tissue-derived cells can be used in either a co-culture or a monolayer system. But what we support here at Thermo Fisher and will be the basis of this webinar are 3D models. They can be the self-aggregated models such as spheroids or organoids or models that are constructed with the use of a bioprinter, which you have control over the shape, uh, the deposition of your cells and biomaterials depending on the program and how you program the uh, bioprinter for your use. So 
steroids and organoid terminology can get a little confusing. So I like to dele delineate between the two uh, because uh, these terms are used interchangeably quite a bit. Steroids or cellular clusters derived from an immortalizer primary cell source, which can grow and proliferate, exhibit some sort of physiological relevance, but they do not organize or differentiate into a new cell type. So what you start with at the beginning of your protocol will be the same cells you end up at the end. But organoids, on the other hand, are derived from a stem cell source. They can grow and proliferate, show that relevance, but they will differentiate or organize into a new cell type or multiple cell types at the end of the protocol. So what you start with at the beginning of your uh, organoid protocol will be different what you see at the end. Given that virtually every feature of a cell's environment is different when you go from two dimensional to three dimensions, it's important to study that these cells, that these cells within the three dimensional, is important to study these cells within the, the context of a three dimensional system. This is nicely summarized in this review from Genentech, where it highlights that while cells grown in 2D create an accessible cellular environment, this environment doesn't really represent what's actually occurring in the in vivo setting. Your cells do not grow in a single plane. They don't grow in plastic with the media, the nutrients, and gas exchange occurring in one direction. Also, the cells, uh, your cells in your body do not have direct access to a drug that it's, uh, it's being treated with. As shown in the image uh, in this A549 uh, steroid image, cells are grown in different planes with cells uh, surrounding it in the X, Y, and Z plane. Uh, extracellular matrix uh, interweaved in between them, showing, providing more connection. And you'll see gradients uh, formed uh, for the nutrients, gas exchange, as well as drug accessibility. The diagram on the right here shows the gradients that are present, say, in a tumor spheroid. There are gradients uh, present here for gas exchange, nutrient distribution, as well as cell proliferation, depending on where the cells are in the model. The cells on the outer portion of the of the model are more proliferative as they have more ac better access to the media, the growth factors, the nutrients that provided uh, in the system. While the cells that are in the middle, further away from those components, are uh, less viable and more necrotic. And this is uh, a, this is a typical phenomenon you would see uh, in a system uh, that does not have vasculature, where you can uh, infuse or flush in or, or pump in the nutrients or, or media, uh, media or, or gas exchange. So with these 3D models, a combination of instrumentation and reagents are necessary to analyze them. And this analysis is readily achieved by use of fluorescent imaging. By combining the image systems with uh, different fluorescent reagents, you're able to visualize the relative aspects of tumor biology. For example, uh, that we're shown here, we can examine the hypoxic nature of a tumor spheroid, as well as looking at apoptotic events in an intact 3D setting. The take a message I want to hammer uh, with this slide is that 3D cell models better represent the tumor environment and assays and instrumentation are needed to explore this dynamic system. So when growing cancer spheroids, there are certain aspects that need to be considered. First of all, spheroid size. Steroids can differ in, compact, in compactness depending on the cell line being used. This image here shows four different cancer cell lines seeded at 5,000 cells per well. And as you can see, each of these cells are of, of various sizes. To, to obtain spheroids for use of a specific diameter to use in a downstream assay, the cell seeding density needs to be optimized. Another factor to look into is how long you have them in culture. Cells that are grown in 2D grow faster than cells that are grown in 3D. Some spheroids will be ready to use within 24 hours, and that's, and that's cell line dependent, while some will require four to maybe up to nine days. The ideal spheroid is, a, is translucent, has a fine boundary, and a minimal dark core, as evident in this particular graph of, the day, of day five for the T47D uh, spheroid. Some cell lines form spheroids on their own, while others will form loose or tight aggregates, which requires some assistance from, uh, from material such as an extracellular matrix to help with the spheroid formation. The ECMs, the extracellular matrix, assist with the cell-to-cell -cell context needed for the cells to aggregate into a, 
compact steroid. In the image here, the PC3 uh, cell line uh, require a bit, little bit of gel tricks to facilitate that steroid formation. In the absence of this matrix, you see that the cells gather together but don't uh, form a compact spheroid. But in the presence of gel tricks at, a, a, at differing amounts depending on the cell density, you see the improvement in the spheroid formation. Finally, uh, they, they discuss the plastic surface required. Uh, primary requirement for sphere formation is a non-adherent surface. Our nupon sphere plates uh, uh, provide that low attachment surface and they help repel the cells from settling to the bottom and they facilitate a uniform formation after you, uh, you spin the plate down. And this uniform spheroid formation is key to keeping the consistency among your spheroid replicates, which can impact your downstream assay results. So with these considerations in mind, there are methods available to create disease models for cancer. Our focus on this webinar will be on developing breast cancer uh, spheroid models. For women, breast cancer is the most common form of cancer. It is estimated that about one out of eight women in the U.S. will develop an invasive cancer during their lifetime. The push for different cancer therapies and having, having a relevant cell model to assess drug response is key. Uh, these 3D cell models that we're developing for cancer become the choice, uh, the model choice for basic preclinical research because they better represent the tumor microenvironment compared to traditional 2D models. <clears throat> this webinar that will focus on the five steps needed to develop a cancer spheroid model, and we're going to use breast cancer as an example. These, uh, these guidelines can be extrapolated to other cancer types as well. So here's a snapshot of the five steps which we'll go into uh, for cancer generation, which will be, we'll go into more detail in subsequent slides. First, we will, we'll discuss how to culture the cells, figure out which cell lines are appropriate to reflect the cancer you are trying to study. Next, we'll discuss generation of the, of the model, you know, optimizing the growth conditions and seeding density for the uh, model of choice. Uh, then we'll optimize this protocol. Uh, so, like, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes these spheroids need a little bit of help to uh, get them to form compact spheroids, so we'll uh, highlight a few optimization uh, methods to do that. Next, we need to characterize the model where you know, you've taken the time to uh, find a protocol that works. We want to make sure that this protocol provides uh, a spheroid model that is healthy, compact, and is, is, is the appropriate size for your, uh, for your assessment. And then finally, uh, with your optimized in, uh, model, you want to be able to measure um, uh, to drug responses on the model to better understand physiological effects of drugs on your cancer system. So cells are the foundation of any cell model and choosing the best cell line and utilizing optimal culture where plastics are crucial for that cell line growth and maintenance. For breast cancer, there are four main types, uh, four main phenotypes of cancer which are listed here the ductal carcinoma, invasive ductal, inflammatory, as well as metastatic carcinoma. The, the image on the right here shows two cancer cell lines that we've optimized here at Thermo Fisher. We've optimized the protocols for developing these particular cancer steroid models. The T47D cancer cell line is an estrogen receptor positive line, uh, which belongs to the invasive ductal type. Or the MDA MB231, which I refer to for the rest of the presentation as 231 cells, is a triple negative uh, breast cancer line belonging to an adenocarcinoma type. So growing and maintaining these cells require particular media and components, but also the best culture plastics to promote, the cell, uh, to promote cell growth and healthy viable cells for spheroid formation. We recommend that as you're you know, culturing your cells that when you uh, are growing the cells, to, to grow them to about 70 to 80 percent confluency before passaging, passaging or harvesting. And also when you're uh, doing the passaging or harvesting and you're detaching them with the dissociation reagent, be mindful of how long you incubate them with that reagent as that can affect the cell viability and health of your cells and culture. Next, we want you to optimize the growth condition and cell seeding density to generate our spheroid. 
The diagram here illustrates the steps needed to harvest and plate your spirit model. The first thing you want to do is achieve a single cell suspension from the cells that we've cultured from the previous step by lifting off the monolayer of cells by utilizing a dissociation reagent such as Tripelli. Uh, harvest the cells and we want to do a cell count utilizing uh, our cell counter or hemocytometer. And we want to determine the cell density needed and then seed them into a low attachment plate, such as a non quantum sphere plate, uh, utilizing a multi channel pipette. Uh, to, uh, to kind of get them going to uh, form uniform spheroids, after you seed the cells, we recommend uh, spinning them for, uh, quickly in the centrifuges to uh, gather the cells, allow them to clump at the bottom of the well. And then after the spin, we'll incubate them uh, in a 37 degree, 5% CO2 incubator. Uh, for a, a certain period of time, depending on the cell type, uh, which may or may not require uh, feeding of one-to-one uh, -one, uh, feeding of spent medium to, uh, to new medium based on the cell line that you choose. Uh, with some cell lines, such as a uh, HeLa cell line or a lung cancer cell line like A549, spheroids will form rather quickly within 24 hours, while others like the uh, PC3 prostate cancer cell line will take five to nine days to form spheroids and that's when you probably want to incorporate uh, a feeding every three or four days. A couple tips uh, when generating these lines is that when optimizing, you want to start with cells that are highly viable, you know, greater than 90%, as uh, lower viable ones may not form spheroids as well. The uh, multi-channel pipette, as I mentioned in the, uh, in the, in the uh, steps here, probably be your best friend in terms of getting these onto the plate. So make sure you have, uh, you have one handy uh, for administering the cells to the, uh, to the low attachment plate. And when adding them to the plates or utilizing the, the pipettes, make sure that you don't touch the bottom of the, uh, of the, low, of the, of the plates, as you may scratch the bottom, which can affect uh, the uh, cells from sticking to the, uh, which, which may affect the cells from forming sure that they may stick to the bottom if the plates are scratched. And then to help with the spheroid formation, as I uh, mentioned, uh, spin the plate uh, shortly after seeding to facilitate the cells clumping together and get the spheroids to form quicker. So depending on the cell uh, type chosen, spheroid formation may differ uh, depending on the cell line used. So for the two bre uh, breast cancer cell lines that we've used, the T470 and, and, and the 231s, it takes them both about three to four days to form uh, spheroids. But as you can see, the line, the cell lines behave differently. They, they look visually different after those, uh, after the, that time frame. So in the above example for the T47D on the left, uh, through experimentation from the R&D team, it was noted that going above 8,000 cells per well, this particular cell line does not uh, yield a uniform spheroid. And it's evident here, as you can see, with the 10,000 uh, the 10,000 cells for out there, they're quite large, especially at day four, you're seeing this really dark sort of necrotic core uh, on um, the forming in the middle. The 231 cells, though, so, at that same time frame, can actually go up to 20K per well uh, in the same time frame and still yield reprodu reproducible spheroids. So again, different cell types uh, different, uh, for, uh, will behave differently uh, the, when forming spheroids. So even with the optimal growth and seeding parameters set from uh, the generation portion, some further tweaks may be needed uh, to generate your spheroid. Uh, some cell, uh, some uh, cells will form spheroids easily, while some finicky cell types will not. And this is evident here in the T47D, uh, which are ready in roughly four to seven days, depending on your cell density. Uh, but for a a finicky type such as the 231 cells, some modifications are required. And in this case, it required a small amount of, of an extracellular matrix, in this case, collagen 1, to help with the spheroid formation. As you can see uh, in, in the graph on the right of the 231 cells, without the collagen, cells do clump, but you, you aren't, uh, they are just forming cell aggregates, not compact defined spheroids, which would be useful for, for when we're uh, uh, testing drug responses on, on chemo. So uh, for this, it was determined uh, that a small amount of, in this case, three micrograms per mill of collagen for, uh, for the 231 cells were required to get that uh, nice compact spheroid to form. Uh, 
So again, different cells will also respond differently to the ECM. So with the 231 cells, I mentioned that collagen uh, was one of choice, but to get to that point, we, we did try different uh, ECM to see if except one worked better. Uh, as you can see, trying uh, another material such as methyl cellulose or different concentrations of a basal membrane extract such as gel tracks, uh, we tried those, but they didn't uh, form that nice tight spheroid as collagen did. And in this instance, we used a high amount of collagen, 50 micrograms per mil of collagen. Once you've found the, the amount that you need, it's recommended that you do a titration of that, uh, of that ECM to see the least amount that's required to form the spheroid. And you can see we were able to titer it down to three micrograms per mil, which was uh, the chosen uh, the chosen amount uh, for going forward with the 231 cells to form spheroid. As you can see, if you go with a, uh, you can go with higher amounts, but there's a certain point where too much ECM may actually be detrimental to uh, forming a nice spheroid. So just a couple of tips when uh, doing this optimal optimization: these ECMs. <clears throat> Uh, many of them are temperature dependent and uh, will polymerize above uh, uh, when you get close to 37 degrees. When you're diluting the ECM stocks, make sure that the uh, medium that you're using are pre-chilled, it's cold, as the ECM will tend to polymerize uh, quickly when the temperature rises. And for this particular cell line, the 231 cells, uh, when you see the cells, you, uh, it's recommended that you let the, the cells sit in the, in, the, uh, in the well for 24 hours uh, let them clump and then add your medium containing your ECM. And this technique for this particular cell line helps uh, facilitate that uniform spheroid formation. Forcing cells to grow in suspension for spheroid formation puts them under a lot of stress. So it's important to assess cell health and viability before using spheroids for downstream assay. Since every cell type has a different shape, spheroid size may not correlate with cell seeking density. In the graph and the image is shown here, these 47D cells yield bigger spheroids compared to the 231 cells. Eight, in, in this example, 8,000 uh, cells uh, for both cell types were seeded in the, uh, in the spheroid plates to yield spheroids, and the T47D yielded a, a diameter of 600, uh, 600 microns after four days, or the uh, under the same seeding density, the different cell type 231 cells yield uh, cells that were a uh, diameter of 300 to 350 within that same time. And this type of imaging was able to be done utilizing uh, uh, a, a, a bright field microscope, which allowed for capturing uh, the spheroids over days and measuring the, the spheroid size in roundness, as shown here. Also, there are several agents that are available for assessing cell viability uh, that are, can be done through image-based methods as well as microplate-based uh, methods. And here we're going to look at a plate-based plate readout. Uh, the Presta Blue uh, cell viability reagent used here measures mitochondrial activity through uh, reduction, a reduction reaction, which will give you a fluorescent signal. Uh, this assay will allow you to monitor the cell viability and health over time. Uh, in this example, uh, the, in, in this example, the press of blue reagent was observed that the 231 cells, uh, the viability increased over time, indicating that during this time frame for both time points that the cells were healthy and dividing. But the uh, measurement didn't give, a, give you an indication of how many cells were dead. So while it did provide viability, uh, it was it's a useful uh, tool for getting a quick assessment uh, for health, as well as looking at the site the effect of a site of cytotoxicity on drugs in sort of a screening aspect. Uh, these assays require the incubation of the spheroids with, uh, with their respective reagents and can be uh, imaged by utilizing uh, uh, tools such as a confocal microscope or, fl or a fluorescent reader, or as well as a plate reader such as our barrier scan lux multimode uh, plate reader. Here we look now. Here we look at an image-based uh, cell, cell health assay. The live dead imaging kit help, here helps visualize the measurement over days as seen in the accumulation of dead cells, the, the red stain, at the core of the spheroids with higher seeding density. So, compared to four-day-old 231 cells, the 
seven-day-old spheroids were found to have more dead cells in the core. Uh, and similarly for the T470, uh, for data and I shown here, the spheroids with the high cell density had more cells uh, in the core. And that, and that is indicative, and that is consistent with our, uh, with our uh, finding that if you grow the T47D cells higher than 8,000 wells per, at 8,000 cells per well, that they will grow, uh, th these, that is not an optimal density as the cells will start forming necrotic core uh, with that increased cell size. And this occurs because there's less access of the cells in the middle to nutrients and oxygen as indicated before. So spherid integrity or sphericity can be measured by using the DII stain. Uh, the DII is a lipophilic membrane stain that is weakly fluorescent until it's incorporated into the cell membrane. In an aggregate, all cells are easily acceptable with the dye, whereas the compactness of the spheroid prevents the dye from entering the core and is concentrated on the outer layers. The compact spheroid would limit entry of the stain towards its core, resulting in a ring-like stain pattern as we see for the 231 spheroid. So there, are several, there are several assays available for you to characterize your models, uh, in addition to the ones that I've mentioned. Now, these include uh, hypoxia and apoptotic readings, which I uh, highlighted earlier, as well as looking at changes in cell proliferation, as well as oxidative stress. So when characterizing a 3D model, uh, most of these assays were optimized in 2D and uh, need, may need to be uh, altered for use in a 3D model. So, Steroids are more resistant to dye penetration compared to monolayers where the dyes have direct access to the cells. So you may need to increase your incubation time of reagents and possibly the concentration that you use. Uh, for plate-based readouts, such as the uh, Veriscan Lux plate reader, uh, depending on the type of readout will determine the type of read setting you would uh, use on your plate reader. For example, if uh, the reading is a media-based uh, readout, you'd want to use the top read function, whereas the reading is uh, cell-based, you want to use the bottom read function. And finally, cell behavior uh, and cell health can be measured over time if your instrument has the capability of utilizing an on-stage incubator to record uh, changes in the uh, spheroid or phenomena of the spheroid over time. So after assessment for cell health and viability of our spheroids, these healthy spheroids can be used for various downstream assays. So we've taken the time to you know, generate this viable breast cancer spheroid model. Now it's time to see how uh, this model can respond to, uh, to different types of uh, therapies. In the example here, the 231 cells were dosed with differing amounts of the apoptotic inducing drug etoposide. As you can see here from the images here, that cell size is decreased. And looking at the <clears throat> at the graph on the right, the, apop the apoptosis measurement was markedly increased, starting at six micrograms, uh, six micromolar of the drug. Uh, and these behaviors can be measured and analyzed using imaging systems such as our cell and site uh, CX7 high content system. So here you're able to image them, get the nice in-depth picture, but also quantify uh, the measurement that you are uh, trying to detect here. Changes in cell proliferation can also be measured when assessing uh, drug efficacy. In this example, uh, we're using the T47D spheroids and treating them with a 100 nanomolar of colchicine for 72 hours. Cell proliferation here was measured using a click at edu cell proliferation proliferation kit and image and analyze again using our CX7 high contact system. The drug of the uh, level of this drug clearly impacted the cell proliferation is uh, evident here in the images and in the graph. What's great about the cell proliferation kit is that it also helps you visualize the spatial orientation for proliferating cells. As cells in the periphery of the spheroid will have a stronger uh, positive proliferative signal than those in the core, again, because those cells are more closer and have more access to the nutrients uh, and media that's present in the system. So when uh, performing uh, your, uh, your dose response and, and your measurements, you want to uh, utilize uh, instrumentation such as confocal imaging uh, with laser illumination, laser illumination, as well as 
uh, the ability to optical optical section the uh, the steroid provide in depth uh, and spatial information about the response that you're seeing in your steroid. And when you perform these assays, you're going through the protocols. Uh, make sure you avoid multiple plate washes uh, when uh, when you can, as these washes can dislodge the steroid, which will make uh, the imaging uh, a bit more difficult. So in summary, I um, hope we were able to, to capture that uh, 3D cell models represent the in vivo environment more accurately than traditional 2D cell models, especially in the cancer setting. Uh, the cancer steroids that we uh, can be generated utilizing the five steps that we've highlighted uh, throughout this webinar. By using the right uh, plastics, the right media, an ECM if needed, and following these tips and tricks, a uniform and reproducible spheroids can be generated can be generated quite easily. And I uh, hope this webinar can highlight that our portfolio, our 3D portfolio at Thermo Fisher supports that robust generation, characterization, and various high through applications for analysis of 3D cancer spirit. We're able to support you throughout the whole workflow from creation, characterization, and analysis uh, here at Thermo Fisher for 3D models. Uh, I want to highlight here some uh, online resource that we have to help you uh, in terms of uh, developing your 3D uh, model. Uh, visit our website at thermofisher.com for more information on how to create 3D models. Uh, following our friendly URL for 3D protocols, uh, much like the uh, cell lines we talked about here, the 231 and the uh, T47D, and our R&D team has characterized uh, eight uh, total cancer cell lines in terms of optimizing their protocols, uh, their seeding densities, and uh, characterization and uh, high, uh, some examples of high qubit assays for various cancer cell lines. And they're uh, walked through in, in really nice detail on this particular site. So it's a great way to, uh, to, uh, to, to start uh, modeling different types of cancers based on these protocols. Uh, we also have a 3D cell culture handbook, which is an encyclopedia of 3D knowledge in one place. It uh, really goes in-depth in into the cell culture workflow, different technologies available, materials, reagents, assays, and the instrumentation uh, you may need. It's a great resource for those looking to transition from 2D to 3D, but also those who are looking to improve on their own uh, 3D knowledge. Uh, we have various application notes on our 3D resources uh, URL. Uh, uh, highlighting uh, this particular uh, one that we discussed in the webinar, but also highlighting the other uh, workflows we support for 3D, such as uh, neural organoids, uh, hepatic steroids for looking at uh, uh, drug metabolism, and also uh, creating 3D skin tissue, uh, the epidermal layer uh, skin tissue. And we also have uh, uh, digital e-learning modules uh, at our virtual learning uh, friendly URL, and we have them uh, for a couple of, of of topics, uh, neural organoid generation from PSDs, uh, basics in 3D culture, as well as our latest one, uh, 3D cell model characterization and analysis. And with that, I will uh, take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Edwin, uh, for that really informative presentation. Uh, we will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located at the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is from Manuela. Um, is it possible to deliver siRNA into 3D tumor spheroid cultures? Yes, actually, it's, that's a great question. Um, as with any uh, delivery system uh, for 3D um, for 3D models, uh, this can be done. But our stance here at Thermo is we recommend doing uh, this type of delivery, which is usually through some sort of transfection, uh, with the cells in 2D first, uh, and then uh, doing your uh, your your transfection delivery, and then creating the 3D model. Uh, we feel that it's a bit more uh, effective uh, when you have the cells linearized versus as a cell clump. 
Uh, there are papers out there that uh, show that it can be done as a whole, uh, as a cell aggregate, but we recommend uh, doing the uh, delivery while the cells are, are, uh, are singularized uh, before Formula 3D model. But, so the short answer is yes, it can be done, but we recommend doing it uh, with the cells in 2D first. Thanks, Edwin. And um, he had a follow-up question. Um, is it possible to perform an uh, immunofluorescence experiment on 3D spheroids, for example, for markers for DNA damage? Uh, yes, uh, we do uh, uh, as part of our, uh, our uh, or, or imaging offering is you ha actually have a DNA damage kit, which actually allows you to study DNA damage and cytotoxicity simultaneously. Uh, so, uh, as with any of our well, for us, uh, or, uh, kits, um, you know we, they've been they've been uh, crea uh, created or optimized using 2D, but have been also uh, been uh, optimized to use in 3D cultures. So uh, we do have a kit available. Uh, for looking at DNA damage, the uh, DNA damage kit uh, uh, offering uh, on our website. Great. Thanks, Edwin. Uh, a question from George. Is spinning down cells required for establishing the cancer spheroids? So how many spheroids do I get per well, for like a 96 well plate? Uh, yeah, uh, great question, George. Um, yeah, spinning down the cells uh, say, after seeing them uh, is one of our recommendations. I think it just facilitates the cells just being in the middle of the well. Uh, given that you're using a low attachment plate, they're going to eventually form uh, the sphere with or without the spinning. But we feel that uh, doing the spinning down post seeding just kind of gives it, uh, kind of gives, gives it a head start and kind of uh, speeds up the process uh, to do it. I think it also it keeps them in the center and I think helps with the uniformity of the uh, of the spheroids. Uh, in uh, on the protocol that we've talked about in this webinar, uh, we're looking at getting a single spheroid per well in the 96 well plate to, um, uh, based on the uh, the methods that we've described uh, in, in this webinar. Great. Um, the next question from Liz, which is the best way to evaluate viability of a spheroid? Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, viability d definitely is a, a key factor when developing uh, these models. Um, uh, and it really depends on, on your readout. Uh, if you're looking at an image-based assay, and I mentioned this in the uh, 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 plate-based assay, if you're, and I mentioned this in, in the webinar, I'll be looking at relative viability where you, you want to have an idea of how uh, maybe uh, a group of, of replicates or the whole plate is doing in terms of its viability. Uh, plate-based assays such as our Presto Blue, a uh, a reduction uh, uh, method that uh, looks at uh, metabolic activity can be used to give you an idea of a quick assessment of if the cells are healthy or if you add a, uh, a drug or a, a, in this case a, a chemo therapeutic to it, how that chemo can, uh, can affect uh, the overall viability. So it's like a quick assessment that you can do uh, using a plate reader. If you have uh, looking at image-based assays, which I think are a bit more informative, uh, like either a fluorescent microscope or a, a high content imager like our, our uh, CX7, uh, you can use, look at things such as uh, live dead staining, which highlights uh, the number of live cells which you would see in the plate-based assay, but also give you uh, a, an idea of how many dead cells are within that individual spheroid. So uh, as opposed to the plate-based assay where you get relative viability uh, per plate or per number of, uh, or, or a larger number of, 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 of spheroids, the, um, the image-based assay as the live dead uh, cell kit will actually give you information on the individual spirit itself. So you actually could uh, see that, quantitate it, and uh, image that, I think, gives you uh, a more in-depth way of looking at how healthy your spirits are. Okay, a couple of more questions. Um, here's one from Mordecai. Um, if we are using microfluidic 3D cultures, can these monitoring done uh, repeatedly without disturbing the culture. And the second part of this question is, can we use these monitoring kits for organoids as well? Or do you have something different to offer? Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Mordecai. Uh, to answer the question for the microfluidic cultures, I'm assuming organ on a chip uh, functionality, uh, in terms of monitoring the repeatedly, you could use uh, similar ways of uh, uh, similar methods that we use for monitoring spheroids uh, in a plate, uh, for sure. I think it's just a, 
I'll, I'll admit I, uh, I am not uh, an expert in the microfluidic cultures, but uh, these um, uh, the assays and ingredients that we that we have are compatible with uh, with uh, the organoid chip uh, methodology. Um, can these kits be used for organoids as well? Yes, they can. Uh, it, I think with the organoids, there's a bit more complexity uh, within them. So uh, you have, have multiple cell types, maybe a bit more extracellular matrix, maybe bigger. Uh, so uh, you may have to uh, adjust some of the parameters for the kits that would use for a spheroid system, which is a bit more simpler, usually a single cell type. Uh, you'd have to adapt that to the organoids, uh, maybe looking at increasing your incubation time, uh, a higher concentration. Um, so just the little things like that, you'll have to adapt to an organized system because uh, there's a bit more cellular uh, complexity uh, to your model. Thanks, Evelyn. Another follow-up question. I have found that the immunofluorescence uh, presents after 24 hours necrotic cells and also healthy cells. And why would um, that be the reason? Okay, uh, so in a, uh, in a freedom model, I just I'm repeating the question here. You're seeing after uh, 24 hours in cultures, the presence of uh, necrotic in healthy cells. Okay, so uh, it really depends on the uh, number of cells that are being played. And if, we're, if we just use the spheroid example, uh, that, you know, I think higher number of cells, the, the spheroids will grow, uh, will definitely grow faster to grow larger uh, in, in most cases. But you'll see, uh, especially with the higher cell densities, the cells in the middle will have less access to uh, the nutrients, the media, uh, the gas, uh, the, uh, the gas exchange uh, will be a, a bit more imp uh, impacted on the cells in the middle. So having less access to uh, to, to nutrients, to, uh, to any growth factors, or, or the way to exchange gas will result in uh, more dead cells in the middle of a of a um, of a, of a cell model, cell aggregate, that doesn't have perfusion or vascularization, uh, which these spheroid models have. So seeing that uh, after 24 hours, most likely with a higher cell density uh, is something that uh, can occur. Uh, an option to have less necrotic cells would possibly, depending on the cell line, seeding less amount of cells uh, so that uh, 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 you'd see just uh, less of the um, uh, it would have less impact in terms of the uh, uh, the uh, access to nutrients compared to the larger cell types. And some the cell lines that, are, that we've optimized uh, internally, uh, th that density differs depending on which one that you're using. Another question, Edwin, is how long does the spheroid stay viable? Uh, I, I think uh, we're seeing a common theme in terms of my uh, answers to this. It's, it's going to start with uh, it depends. Uh, also, it depends on the cell line that you're using. Uh, but also, if you're going to um, uh, the 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 seeding number, uh, the seeding density uh, will, will uh, take in fact. If you have too many cells and they grow too big, you're going to see that necrotic core that we see uh, in uh, that we saw um, uh, that you mentioned in the in the previous question. So if you're going to take if you want to grow them out longer, I mean, there's, in, again, it, it's uh, it depends on the cell line that uh, if you're going to, if you want them to grow longer, you could seed them at a lower density, you know, spin them down, uh, let them grow and form the spirit, and uh, do uh, uh, feedings uh, periodically, whether they're two every three days, uh, and that, that has to be optimized as well. So I would go with the lower, uh, to have them longer in culture, uh, grow them at a lower cell density, and possibly incorporate uh, a, a media feed at, at some point during the protocol. I mean, I, I think really the viability depends on the, the, the number of cells that are in there, because if you have a high number of cells, they'll get big really fast, and then we'll show the necrosis faster than a uh, lesser dense uh, uh, spheroid model. And we have a few more questions. So, um, how many of how many other tissue types or cancer types can you apply uh, this methodology to? Yeah, I uh, so what we um, f from uh, the webinar, I think this the methodology talked about can be applied to pr pretty much. Uh, any of the different cancer uh, types that are available for a cancer cell line, and the uh, you know using the optimization that we showed in this webinar, with the caveat that one method will not apply to all lines, uh, to all lines that uh, that are available. But we should, the, uh, the webinar that and the uh, tips that I provided should at least give you some idea of how to um, 
uh, to grow them uh, for a particular length of time or to a particular size. So you, uh, you can use other cancer cell types utilizing uh, the tips that were uh, highlighted here. Excellent. The next question, how do you determine what seeding density you need for the spheroid generation? Uh, yeah, um, I guess it, with, it, again, it depends on the cell type that you're using. So um, I, I think if, I, you know, you have to take into account how fast it takes a cell line to reach that optimal size of 300 to 500 mi uh, micrometers. And um, on certain cell types that we have, which we uh, show uh, uh, that we've optimized uh, um, internally, uh, we have uh, some images, bright field staining or, or uh, live dead staining show you the morphology as well as the health of the cells based on different seeding densities and length and culture. So, uh, you know, I definitely would, you know, be sure you, you know, read the, if you're looking at our, our protocols, you know, read the tips that are provided in the protocol for optimal growth. Uh, for example, uh, for the T47D uh, breast cancer line, uh, it is recommended, and I'm glad that our research and R&D team uh, uh, found this out, that growing them at densities of higher than 8,000 cells or more for, uh, pr will produce uh, the necrotic steroids uh, rather uh, rather fast. So um, if, you know, you need them in the culture longer, you know, you'd want, you probably would not want to go to that uh, particular cell type. Uh, so, I mean, it's, I think you really have to factor in how long you're going to have them in culture, but also uh, that's just to establish the line, but how long you're going to add the drug to see the effect on it too. So that will play a role in terms of uh, how long it's going to be in culture total, but also how, how much you need to start with. And I would recommend going smaller, uh, lower in the density to add the development time, but also uh, the drug testing time as well. Great. The next question, have you worked with mesenchymal cells and have you seen extracellular matrix on um, these, I guess? Uh, I uh, personally have not worked with uh, mesenchymal cells in a, in a sphere setting uh, it, based on the protocols that we've used, uh, that, that I've highlighted here. I've used them in combination uh, with the bioprinter uh, to develop a, a different type of model. Um, uh, so I, I, for, for your question, I, I, I don't think I could, I could um, recommend uh, any recommendation on this, uh, but I could reach out to you offline to, uh, to address any, uh, issue, any questions you have and possibly relay them uh, to our internal team uh, to help you with any questions you have with the mesenchymal cells. Great, thanks, Edwin. The next question, um, when would I use a plate-based characterization assay versus an image-based one? Yeah, uh, so again, the plate-based assays are used for, say, relative quantitation of a, say, particular uh, characterization parameter you're looking at. Uh, the, uh, again, the Presto Blue viability assay again, gives you relative cell health data without giving you a sense of or an image of uh, how much cell death is present. So uh, we would use this type of assay, the, the plate base for quick assessment of cell health for your model. But again, for more detailed information, you know, we uh, recommend uh, an image-based assay such as the live dead uh, assay, or you can look at other parameters such as uh, hypoxia uh, or, um, or, uh, or oxidative stress. Uh, and with those types of image-based assays, you can visualize the amount of death, but also uh, quantitate uh, 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 the, la the loss of viability uh, based on the uh, on an individual spheroid basis. So uh, it just depends on how much detail that you want uh, with the, uh, with your measurement. Okay, and I see one other question. Um, how do I image a spheroid that's in suspension and floating in a well? Yeah, it's uh, definitely a common question. Uh, these are you know, cells that are in suspension as opposed to adherent cells, so they're not really fixed uh, at the bottom. Uh, one of the things, especially if you utilize our, uh, our high content platforms, we develop a particular uh, uh, program, uh, uh, a program to assist with this type of uh, uh, function, it's the uh, Eureka Scan Finder, uh, which allows for a seek and scan functionality of uh, your spirit within a well. So when you apply this finder, uh, the spheroids or, or the uh, in, in the will are identified during a, a particular seek operation at a low magnification. So it actually, it will in one shot with a low magnification, will find the, the spirit in the well. And once it's found, it automatically does a second 
uh, scan at a higher magnification to give you the high-end resolution. Uh, so this, uh, utilizing this finder uh, reduces the imaging time as well as your file size significantly. Uh, usually in a uh, normal uh, scan of a well, uh, it does individual, like say 10x uh, scans, which uh, can take, uh, there's like probably like 25 of them in a particular well, which adds to a lot of your scan time. Here doing the, the, the low mag and high mag, you're really just taking two, uh, two quick shots, again, reducing your, uh, your imaging time and the actual number of files you're, uh, that you're saving, uh, improving the efficiency of how you analyze your model. Okay, the next question. Um, for drug testing, do you recommend less than uh, 1,000 cells or just less than 8,000? Uh, yeah, I, I, again, it's, uh, it is cell, uh, cell line dependent and will depend on how long you're going to have them in culture. Uh, I probably would not go with, with eight, uh, the sort of rule of thumb, but I probably would not go with 8,000 because I think with most of the cell lines, that'll, uh, if, you're, if you need to carry them out for creating them all, then adding a particular uh, drug, it'll probably, uh, the, the cells will, I think will, will be necrotic in the middle. So I would recommend on the lower side, and it may take a bit of optimization uh, on, on, on your end to see uh, which works, but I would, um, some cell lines that we have uh, do work uh, at less than a thousand cells if you carry them out long enough. Uh, some, you know, will require a thousand or two thousand cells. So. Um, I would go on the on the on the lower end uh, for sure if you're if you're trying to figure out how to uh, time it for growth and also testing. Thank you. So I think that's the last of our questions. Um, let me just see if there's any that are coming in. If not, um, Edwin, thank you. Um, and do you have any final comments for our audience? Uh, yeah, um, again, uh, with this uh, webinar, but also on our, our website, I mentioned that some of the, uh, uh, the resources that we have available. You know, we uh, support really here at Thermo Fisher the entire 3D cell culture workflow. Uh, today we're talking about how to create a model, a steward model, but we can also support you with the characterization, looking at cell health and functionality, but also how to image and uh, to image and analyze. So we can, uh, what we provide in terms of support is how um, uh, is that we can support you from all different aspects of the 3D cell culture workflow. So you know, definitely if you have any questions regarding any of that, please feel free to contact me or you know, just take a peek on our website. We've got a lot of material, uh, application notes, uh, brochures uh, to highlight a lot of the products. So. Uh, definitely, uh, you know, we're, we're here to help you on your 3D journey. Excellent. Thank you again, Edwin, for your time today and for sharing your research um, and some of the ongoing initiatives at Thermo Fisher. I would like to also thank um, Lab Roots for hosting today's uh, educational webcast. But before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. And the questions we didn't have time to get to today um, and those submitted during the on-demand, we will um, be addressed, um, those will be addressed by Edwin, the speaker, uh, via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. So this webcast can be viewed on demand. Lab Roots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. So please also share the email with your colleagues who have um, may have missed today's uh, live event. Until next time, thank you and goodbye.